welcome. Can you all hear me okay? Um, and welcome to the people who are watching online as well. It is wonderful to be gathering today on this rather cool morning. Um, I've been told I'm not feeling the cold this morning. Uh, to continue our journey through Romans. We will be speaking a lot about God's love and grace for us today. And it is my hope that not only will uh, we know more about God's love today, that we might experience more of God's love today. We're going to start by singing our intro, which is just the first verse of singing praise and thanksgiving, hymn number 107. Uh, we don't have to stand in the congregation here. We will remain seated. Uh, let's sing the first verse together as a way of preparing ourselves for worship. Let's continue in prayer. Let's pray. Light of Christ, be with us here this morning. May we sense the glory of your presence in our midst. Shine amongst us in such a way that the darkness within and without may be pushed back so that we may truly see you for who you are. Help us to recognise our dependence upon you Enable us to behold the world as you created it to be, as you created us to be. Empower us to move from darkness to light, from sin to new life. May your light within us shine through in worship, in our worship this day. We pray this in the name of the word made flesh, the light which is light to all people, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn today is the hymn Immortal, Invisible, God Are Only Wise. I think this is a great opening hymn because it's full of uh, some images about God that helps us to reflect upon the greatness of God, which is what an opening hymn of praise should do. So let's sing together hymn number 143, Immortal, Invisible.
Our responsive psalm for today comes from Psalm 51. I have a feeling I only just recently did Psalm 51. I don't know if you remember your responsive psalms very well, but I looked at it and went, hmm, that looks rather familiar. So I'm not sure what I've done here. But Psalm 51, um, great words. If we have used it recently, uh, we will uh, remind ourselves of them again. So I ask you to respond with the bolded words which are either in your booklets or if you're watching online on the screen. So the Lord, uh, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my My rock, my fortress and my deliverer in whom I take refuge. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God beside the Lord? And who is the rock except for our God? It is our God who arms me with strength and keeps my ways secure. Therefore I will praise you, Lord, amongst the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. So yes, let's do that. Let's sing the praises of God's name with the next hymn, Glory be to God the Father. Our Bible reading today may look a bit similar to last week's Bible reading because part of it is. I think Romans chapter 8 was too good of a chapter only to do one sermon on. And so I've come back to have a second go at Romans chapter 8. I'm not preaching the same as Kevin last week, don't worry. Uh, But we're going to hear the beginning part of Romans 8, which you didn't hear last week, and the end of it, which you did hear last week. And Val's going to come and read that for us. Thanks, Val. The Bible reading for today is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ, Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened, By the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. 
and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit and when do we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose for those God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those he predestined he also called those he called he also justified and those he justified he also glorified what then shall we say in response to these things if God is for us who can be against us who he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give in all things who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen it is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns no one Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persuasion or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any power neither height nor depth <coughs> nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord Amen that is the word of the Lord when I was at theological college my preaching lecturer taught us uh, the power of a well placed pause it, it is if you do a pause people look up and listen because they think that you're just about to say something important. Either that or you've forgotten what to say and they look at you anyway. By the ways that the Gospels are written, you can sort of see that Jesus may have used pauses a lot. You know, like if I put up this um, Matthew eleven twenty eight, it says, you know, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest take my yoke upon me and learn from me for i am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul can you see how that works you can do that with most of jesus writing um, uh, because i reckon that jesus was using those pauses to highlight what he wanted to say the Apostle Paul writing Romans is very different. Paul doesn't seem to pause at all. Paul just goes for it. As I said last week, uh, two weeks ago, probably uses too many words, but just goes for it. Paul was a rabbi, a teacher like Jesus, but he was also a, a Pharisee, a key influencer, and probably one of the key people in the Sanhedrin uh, we don't know that for certain, but he probably was. And so Paul was more like a lawyer than a narrative preacher. And actually that symbolism of a courtroom scene actually helps unlock some of the power 
of the book of Romans. So in your mind, I want you to imagine a courtroom. And this is not a normal courtroom, it's the courtroom of righteousness. And we are the people who stand accused. And they are trying to work out whether or not we are righteous, that we are right with God. And so far in chapters 1 to 7, Paul and the prosecutor have been going backwards and forwards. And Paul's trying to give us his understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you can sort of imagine going back and forwards. The prosecutor says that we're taught that perfectly following God law makes us right with God. But all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Therefore, we're all condemned. But Paul says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we find forgiveness and life. But the prosecutor says, but the wages of sin is death. And Paul says, yes, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can you see this going back and forth? So it's a bit like a courtroom scene and they're arguing their points over us. And then we get to the reading we had today in Romans chapter 8. It's almost like Paul dramatically looks at all of us and throws his hands open and says, there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Do you get that? There's no condemnation. Let that sink in. They're trying to work out whether we're condemned or not, whether we are righteous or not. And Paul says, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are not condemned. I sort of wish Paul would pause on that point because it's a good point. But Paul does it in Romans 8. He makes this great statement, there's no condemnation, and then immediately moves on. Because he goes on to say that in response to this, we should lead spirit-led lives. And that's what Kevin was preaching about last week when he preached on Romans chapter 8. The help the Holy Spirit has to come into our lives and to help us in all that we say and think and do. But then we come to the last part of the Romans chapter 8. It's almost like the prosecutor and Paul get their final speeches, their closing statements, so to speak. And the prosecutor stands up to give theirs. And they say, all right, God might declare us as forgiven. God might see us as perfect. But the reality is, is that we're not. It's one thing to say that God declares us as his redeemed children, holy, pure and faultless. But declaring something doesn't change the reality that we still sin. (laughs) That's still the case in our lives. We still don't reach that standard that God sets. And this is the dilemma that we have in the courtroom. Paul is right in his arguments from Romans chapters 1 to 7 that why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That that through Jesus' death and resurrection we can find forgiveness and we can be justified and we can be seen as righteous. Paul is right. But the prosecutor is also right. We still sin. (laughs) We're not perfect. So how does this work? In the middle part of Romans chapter 8, and Kevin picked on this last week, picked up on this last week, he said that we all groan and creation groans. And it's almost because we're caught in this tension between the now and the not yet. Have you ever heard me use that term before? I've used it before. You may not remember. What Paul is talking about is that there's this tension between what has happened and what is still to happen. I've drawn this little picture and I'll put it up on the screen for the people watching online, is that when we accept Jesus into our life, we are justified. God forgives our sins. Our slates are clean. We are seen as perfect. But then we head into this 
long period of sanctification. I, I taught that two weeks ago. This idea that God, through the Holy Spirit, works in our lives to shape and mould us into the people that we want us to be. God works in us to help us become more like Jesus. But that's a lifelong process. Are any of us perfect yet? No. That's not going to happen until we get to heaven. And so we're caught between the now, God seeing us as perfect and declaring us as righteous, and the not yet. We're still on the journey to be perfect and righteous. And so we have this tension. So in a sense, both Paul and the prosecutor are right. We are stuck between the now and the not yet. There is a part in there about predestination. I'm going to skip over that. And I'm going to ask the question, so what's the verdict? If we are the people who are being accused, we want to know what the verdict is. Are we right with God or not? It's almost like Paul steps up to do his closing argument now. And whereas in Romans chapters 1 to 7 and even half of chapter 8, Paul has methodically used his notes to go through and make his points and arguments. It's almost like when he gets to the end of chapter 8, he throws his notes aside and speaks from the heart. And he asks a series of rhetorical questions. Well, I say rhetorical, but I don't know if he wants her answer or not, because Paul doesn't really pause to wait for an answer, which is why I'm calling them rhetorical. So he starts off by saying, what can we say in response to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Well, lots of things can be against us, can't they? The world can be against us. Mean people can be against us. Corrupt politicians, greedy corporations. Life itself can be against us. I know that some of us would say that our health can sometimes be against us. So we could answer, there's lots of things that are against us. But that's not the question that Paul asks. If you look at the words again, he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, then who can be against us? And I think this is the point. Lots of things might be against us, but if God is for us, then all of those sort of things fade into not being as important. God is bigger than anything that we are facing. God is bigger than any circumstance that we might be in. God is bigger than any problem or tragedy or health issue that we might be encountering. Paul is right. If God is for us, who can be against us? As I said, I really wish Paul would pause on these points because that's a really good point. Does Paul pause? No. No. He goes straight on to his next question. Well, who will bring any charge against those who... Um, whoops, I'm on to the next slide. Who brings any charge against those whom God has chosen? Paul goes, well, it's certainly not God who's bringing the charge because God has done everything for us. And we can see that through God giving his, us his son, Jesus. If God has done all of this, God's not bringing a charge against us. Jesus is not bringing a charge against us. It's through Jesus we find forgiveness. So then Paul goes straight on to his next question. Then who condemns us? Not God, because God justifies us. Not Jesus, who died and rose again, and who now intercedes on our behalf with God. Well then, who is condemning us? It's almost like we have an epiphany moment. Like the woman caught in adultery when she is asked the exact same question. Who condemns you? And we suddenly realise, no one. No one condemns us. Which makes us loop right back to verse 1 in Romans chapter 8. What did verse 1 say? There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Paul's just proving his point. No one is condemning us. Paul, once again, doesn't pause. He keeps going. So therefore, if God is for you, 
if no one is bringing any charges against you, and if no one is condemning you, then is there any barriers that will stop you from having a loving relationship with your God? Is there any barriers? Well, the way that Paul words that question, he says, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Can heart trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? We could list more things in. You know, could terrible circumstances, could tragedies, could unjust accusations, could horrible people separate us from the love of cross, Christ? Could difficulties, can they separate us? Can being overwhelmed in life separate us from the love of Christ? Can any or all of these things separate us from the love of Christ? And in one of those rare moments, I can actually imagine Paul at this point pausing and just letting that question hang in the courtroom. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Paul pauses and then simply responds, No. No. No, they can't. The love of Christ is much stronger than all of those things. Actually, Paul goes on to say that in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's because of God's love that we can rise above all these things. The love of Christ conquers all. Are you getting this? This is just amazing teaching by Paul. And a bit like a teacher in a school, I'm going to ask you a series of pop questions just to make sure that you've heard what I've said today. Are you ready for this? Is God for you or against you? Yeah, this is not a rhetorical question. I'm actually asking you to respond here. Is God for you or against you? Because of the cross of Jesus, does God bring any charges against you? No. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, who condemns you? No one. No one. No one condemns you. Well, therefore, what can separate you from the love of Christ? Can trouble or hardship separate you? Nothing. Can difficult circumstances or tragedies separate you? Can harshness of life or the darkness of this world separate you? No. Can even hate separate you from the love of Christ? No. no. Paul is convinced. I am convinced. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be ever able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What do we say to that? Amen to that. Amen to that. We're going to respond to this great good news that we find in Romans 8 by singing our next hymn. I just have to find it in all my notes down here. Oh, that's right. I wanted to respond by giving God praise. And the hymn that I thought of was How Great Thou Art. A great hymn of praise for all that God has done. As we do this, I'm also going to, um, we're going to take up our offering. And at the end of this hymn, we'll sing together the doxology. So let's sing this great hymn of praise, How Great Thou Art.
we come now to this table of the Lord to share in this sacrament a sign of Jesus' body and blood which has been given for us. Everyone is welcomed at this table. You, we may think that we're not worthy, but it's been declared today there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. All of us are welcome. There are some responses that I have in this order of service um, that will, that's our, in your order of service or on the screen. So, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed. And we come to this table acknowledging the greatness of God and all that God has done for us. We come to this table remembering Jesus' life and death and resurrection. We come to this life anticipating God's ministry in our lives and healing for the world. So let us pray. We praise and bless you, holy and gracious God. You loved us because you are loved. From the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the deep and you brought all things into being. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. And it was good. But sometimes we confess that we have not always followed your way. Sometimes we have wandered far. And we have not lived up to the standards of your glory. But as a mother cares for a child, you have not forgotten us. Time and time again, you've reached out and called us back in the fullness of your love. And so on this day, we join with our community here and those online, as well as with those around the world and even the saints that have gone before us to declare your song of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. We remember the story of how we got this sacrament. That on the night that Jesus was betrayed, on the night before he died on the cross, he had a meal with his friends. And as part of the meal, he took some of the bread. He gave thanks. And he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. He said, whenever you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and he passed it amongst his friends saying, this is my blood which is shed for you and for many. It is a symbol of the new covenants that has been sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of us all. See, whenever you drink of the cup, do so in remembrance of me. And that's what we do today. We eat of the bread, we drink of the cup, and together we declare our faith that Christ has died. Christ has has risen, and Christ will come again. Let us pray again. Lord God, we come now to share in the riches of the table, but we cannot forget those in our world and our local community who are suffering and need our prayers. So today we pray for all who are grieving, all who are unwell, all who are struggling in isolation, all who are scared, all who are tired and frustrated. God, we ask that you'll come to them with healing, comfort, peace and hope. Now as we gather at this table, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come on us that we may receive these gifts in remembrance and thanksgiving and breathe your Holy Spirit on these gifts but also on all the world that they may also understand your love for us. We pray these things through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, who brought us, taught us to pray together 
the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This table is open to all people. The way that we're going to do this today is Val's going to come and help me. She's going to bring the bread around to you. I invite you to uh, receive the bread and eat the bread when you receive it uh, in remembrance and thanksgiving. Because I will pause and then after a little while I'll bring around the cup as well um, so that you can drink in thanksgiving. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the love, forgiveness, grace and hope that we've received through this sacrament. We ask that as we move into this week, that the Holy Spirit will continue to work within us, helping us share that same love, forgiveness and grace with all that we meet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you've been enjoying our journey through Romans. We've still got two more weeks to go yet. Chapters 10 and chapters 12, both great chapters in Romans. But I thought that as we finish this service today, I really wanted to pick up on what Paul seems to do. Above all, he keeps coming back to the cross of Jesus and reminding us of that grace, that love and forgiveness that we receive through Jesus' death and resurrection. And so to finish with, um, I thought it'd be good to sing uh, the great hymn, Lift High the Cross, which is seemingly what Paul is doing all throughout Romans, highlighting that for people and inviting them to respond. So let's sing together our final hymn.
way to finish. But I pray that as we leave this place, that we may have ringing in our ears both sides of that coin that Paul proclaimed today. That there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. And as a result of that, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. May we not only know that, but experience that this week. And may the blessing of God in all God's fullness, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, continue to remain with you and your loved ones today and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our benediction song. Now unto him who is able to keep, able to keep you from falling, and present you faultless before the presence of his glory will exceed. Thank you for joining with us and for the people watching along, thank you for joining with us. If you wish to contact me or Kevin for any reason, our numbers are on the screen. We look forward to coming back next week as we dive into Romans chapter 10. See you then.